Our speaker today is a scientist and above all, a creative th thinker. He's an entomologist by training, studying the smaller residents of our planet and their importance to all of life. Think of the infamous Cornwall gnats. The theme of our annual newsletter was to think globally and act locally. Think globally about climate change and do something locally to adapt, adapt to it. And I've been inspired by our speaker's ideas about just how to act locally. He will talk about an hour and then we'll have uh, time for questions. Please welcome Doug Ptolemy. Thank you very much, Bart. Now, can we all see that? All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. I, I wanna talk about uh, what my idea of homegrown national park is. And what we're really talking about is building the networks, the connectivity between preserves such as what, what the conservancy owns um, so that we can support life everywhere. Before we get into that though, let's take a look at this. It looks like a fecal sack. You know, the birds in a nest don't want their babies pooping all over the nest. So babies have evolved these little fecal sacs. They put their rear end in the air and the parent takes the fecal sac and flies off the nest and drops it somewhere. And that's what this is supposed to look like. If you look closely though, it's actually a spider. Of course, if you look like a fecal sac, nobody wants to eat you. And at night, it's a bowl of spider. At night, it hangs from a leaf uh, like this. And instead of building a web, it drops one strand of, of silk with one sticky glob of glue at the end there, and it goes hunting. You wouldn't think it would catch anything, but it does. Moths fly in there. Uh, they get stuck in that, that uh, glob of glue. And she quickly spins them around, wraps them up in silk, and has a nice meal. Then she cuts them loose, and she hunts again. And if she catches enough moths over and over again, she gets enough energy to make a an egg sac. This is how the uh, the species overwinters, as eggs in an ornamental silk pouch like this. Uh, and if she goes hunting again and is successful, she can make two or three egg sacs. Uh, well, the real question is, why are moths flying into this single target? Uh, it seems like that would never happen. But uh, it happens because she's actually releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moths. Uh, so these are all males that come in. They think she's a female. She is, but the wrong species. And I was interested in finding out what species of moth the bola spiders in my yard were catching. And it turns out it's the bronze cutworm. What I did was unwrap those little bodies that she cut loose and found out it's a bronze cutworm. And I have bronze cutworm adults because I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars and I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got goldenrod. That's their primary host plant. I also had this beautiful moth, the dot line white because I've got oak trees, particularly white oaks. And because I don't rake away the leaves from underneath those trees, there is a dot line white cocoon in this leaf batch. And if you were raking it, you'd never see it. It's right there. There it is a little in, in large. But again, uh, there's a lot of things living in the leaves that we rake away uh, and, and throw away. So uh, it's a destructive process right there. I've got the evening primrose moth uh, in our yard because I planted evening primrose. And the moth came. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. I've got uh, zebra swallowtails because we planted pawpaws specifically to attract zebra swallowtails. Uh, it would take me a long time to describe all the things that have come to uh, the, the property that we now call home, uh, but it wouldn't take me very long to describe the species that are on a typical residential property. Uh, there is no goldenrod, so there's no bronze cutworms, so there's no bola spiders. There's no oak trees, so there's no dot line whites. There's no evening primrose, so there's no evening primrose moth. There's no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtails. In fact, there's very little that can live in a typical residential landscape. And we've got over 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the U.S., and that's one of the reasons that we see headlines like this on a pretty regular basis. The insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North, our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife already gone. The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. A prediction, but one we have to make sure it does not happen. 
40% of Earth's plants face extinction. So bad news is pretty much everywhere. And that's why Elizabeth Culbert gets to write this book, The Sixth Extinction, talking about the sixth great extinction event that the Earth is experiencing right now. But this is the first one that is being caused by a living being, and that, of course, is us. Uh, a lot of people don't like this news, and I'm one of them. Uh, and, and people are actually studying our response to uh, the news about biodiversity losses. One of those people is Richard Hobbs, uh, and he recently wrote a paper that says that our response to the loss of biodiversity is very similar to the five stages of grief that we, we typically uh, experience when we hear we have a terminal disease. First, there's denial. And there's certainly a lot of denial out there. Oh, we don't have any problems at all. And there's anger, got some of that too. Bargaining, oh, what can we do to make it better? Depression, way too much of that. Then stage five is acceptance. But this is where I'm gonna push back because acceptance is the same thing as giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option because nature is not optional. Um, so I'm going to propose a sixth stage and that is action. We actually can do something about biodiversity loss. And we do have parks, we do have preserves. Our national parks were established primarily to preserve their exquisite beauty. And they are, they are beautiful places. And of course, Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with expanding the, the national park uh, system. And this is what he says about that. He says, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy's uh, patting himself on the back and, and he should, he deserved it. Of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. So in other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not created uh, with the idea of conservation in mind. And that's why we only have 3.6% of the US in national parks. Only 12% is federally protected, which means 88% is not federally protected. Um, well, a lot of people wonder why the parks and preserves that we have are not enough to sustain the biodiversity that we humans need. Remember, it is nature that keeps us alive on this planet. And that's a good question. The, there's actually several answers to it, but the big one is that they are too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little habitat patch, and this is an exaggeration, uh, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. In bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, this top line here, even in your down cycle, you've got enough individuals so that when times get better, you can increase quickly. But if you're a tiny population, often in your down cycle, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch and then you're gone. And unless you can recolonize that habitat patch and picture a box turtle or a salamander crossing a, a major highway, doesn't happen, then you're permanently gone. And that's called local extinction. Uh, and their people have been studying this all over the planet for a long time, more than a hundred years now. Uh, and they always come up with the same answer. The natural areas we have left on this planet are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we humans need. Because again, nature is not optional. Now we tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble. Uh, but I think that's a mistake. That's, that's like going to the doctor when you're already dead. It's, it's a little late. Um, let's talk about defaunation, the, the uh, loss in abundance of uh, populations of what were once common species. You're looking at the American chestnut here. It used to be the dominant tree along the crest of the Appalachians from uh, Maine all the way down to Georgia. Um, it's not extinct, but it's functionally extinct. Uh, the chestnut blight uh, essentially wiped it out. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, it's not extinct either, but it used to be one of the most common bumblebees across the country. Now, if you see one, it's a big deal because it is on the edge of extinction. So functionally, again, it's extinct. American beaver, again, they're not extinct. As a matter of fact, they're, they're coming back on some level. But um, when Europeans arrived here, beavers had, uh, they controlled the hydrology of the entire country, major rivers right down to small streams. We trapped them out uh, everywhere. Uh, so there's a few left and, and you know, we tolerate them in some places, but um, the, the hydrology that they once established is, is no longer in place. So defaunation is the real problem, the reduction in abundance, uh, and it's local, 
it's everywhere and we don't even notice it. And we don't even notice it because of something called shifting baseline. We tend to think that, that the way things were when we were kids is the way they always have been and the way they should be. Um, because it's what we experienced when we were growing up. None of us missed the passenger pigeon because it was gone. It was extinct before any of us were born. Born. It used to be the most abundant bird on the entire planet. So shifting baseline means we're losing biodiversity, the biodiversity that sustains us, and we don't even notice it. So what should we do? Um, well, the, the UN has finally noticed it. Uh, they had a big conference last year in Montreal uh, to talk about the issue of global biodiversity decline. This was a headline that came out of that, that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect the, the uh, biodiversity that keeps us alive on this planet. It's amazing. Um, so, you know, I'm glad they're noticing it. That's good. But what they're going to do is pass a resolution, maybe someday, that nobody will listen to. So I'm not counting on the UN to actually solve the problem. E.O. Wilson spent most of his career trying to save life on planet Earth. And in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He did not spend a lot of time telling us how we were gonna save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biology, E.O. Wilson's ideas are great. We'll just put half the Earth aside and all those things that are in trouble can be in that half. We can be in the other half and it will be wonderful. The problem, of course, is that half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and I don't see that going away. And we've got 8 billion people, and all of our, our hardscape, our detritus, our railroads, our airports in the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? I actually think we can, and that's basically what I want to talk about today. But... In order to do that, we need a new approach to conservation. We have got to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. It's an age-old idea. We got humans here and nature someplace else. Uh, you know, in most places, there is no someplace else. Um, so what I want to argue today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists works pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that is pretty much everywhere. Uh, so we're not just going to do conservation here. We're going to do it here as well, which means we have to move beyond conservation to restoration. We've got to put it back. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Brand new concept. We're going to have nature thriving in human-dominated landscapes. Not hanging on by a thread, not getting diminished every year, but thriving. That means we've got to talk about habitat fragmentation. The uh, viable habitats that we have in, in so many places are highly fragmented. We've got little patches here, little patches here, and then, of course, we and our cities and our agriculture are in, in the middle, in between these, these viable habitats. So the proposal is we're going to build um, biological carters that connect them. So plants and animals can move back and forth, uh, and that will be a big step towards saving them. It will be a step towards saving them, but you know what? It will not save them because the habitats will still be small. They'll still be bleeding species over time. Um, so what we need to do is not have biological carters. We've got to have viable habitat in between the existing viable habitats. This is good. This is even better. The light areas here will be our, our cities and our, our agriculture. But uh, the rest of it is going to be where we live and where we work, where we play. Um, and, and we can do this by simply putting the plants back. Of course, you know, conservancy properties are in here, too. They're doing doing uh, wonderful things to help this happen. But we're talking about private property. We're going to do conservation on private property, and that means we need a new attitude towards property rights. We have this idea that we get to own a piece of the earth, and we can do whatever we want with it. Uh, but you got to remember, our yards are not like Las Vegas. You know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. 
But what happens on our yards does not stay on our yards. That's the difference because our yards are part of local ecosystems. Whatever we do on our property impacts that ecosystem either uh, positively or negatively. Let's look at the consequences of a big lawn. Uh, on local ecosystems. The amount of lawn you have is gonna determine whether rain il infiltrates when it, when it storms or whether it leaves the stormwater runoff. It's gonna determine whether we're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides, all those pollutants to our local watershed, all the things we put on our lawn. It's also gonna determine how much carbon we are adding to the atmosphere every time we mow it. It's going to determine how well we're supporting uh, local pollinators because lawn, of course, doesn't provide any of the resources that pollinators need. It's going to determine how much carbon we're pulling out of the atmosphere and tying up in our uh, in, in the plants that we have on our property. If it's lawn, we're not tying up anything. Um, and of course, the plants we have on our property are pumping carbon into the, the soil where it uh, is very stable. And some plants are a whole lot better at doing that than, than others. The plant choices we have for our property are going to determine whether we're, we're harboring ecological tumors like, like a calorie pear or burning bush or barberry or all the things that we uh, have planted ornamentally in our yard that then escape our yard and become serious invasive species, pushing out the native plants that do run our, our ecosystems. And finally, the plant choices that we have for our yard are going to determine how well we're supporting the food web, whether or not you're using plants that actually host the insects that support uh, uh, the animals higher up on the food web or not. In other words, how we landscape is going to determine the carrying capacity of our local ecosystems, which in, in the you know, bigger sense is going to determine how much life Earth can sustain. And that is an awesome responsibility. And it's an awesome responsibility that homeowners, that property owners everywhere do not know that they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. There are a lot of us out there. Uh, and and mo many of us, most of us, I don't know what the percentage is, but we own a lot of property. We own 78% of the country privately, 85.6% east of the Mississippi privately owned. Um, which makes the future of conservation um, for these property owners, they are the, the hope in the future of conservation. It, it is now, uh, whether or not it succeeds, it's going to depend on how well we do conservation on these private properties. Let's return to lawn again because it's the low-hanging fruit. We've got more than 44 million acres of lawn in, in this country. Um, that's an area bigger than all of the New England combined, and it's dedicated to an ecological deadscape. And you know why we do this. It's a, it's a status symbol. And we have to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half, replace half that lawn? Uh, let's make the math simple. Let's say we got 40 million acres. We're going to cut that in half and restore it uh, with, with a functioning ecosystems right at home. That's enough area to create that new national park I'm talking about, homegrown national park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. If you add up all these parks, still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park would be the biggest park in the country. Uh, what are we at? We, we now have a small nonprofit called homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, or that's where you can, you can go to our website and you can join and you can join for free. All we're asking is that people register where their property is and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. Uh, so maybe you're going, you really are going to reduce the area, uh, the area of lawn. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to uh, put an aster in a flower pot. Whatever you do counts, then that little area uh, in your county is going to light up with a firefly. And the object, of course, is to get the message that property owners everywhere are responsible for the future of conservation. We want that message to go viral because most people don't know that. So rather than this, uh, scattered uh, uh, national parks, we're going to turn the country into this. We can do it. It's not a big ask. 
What really are we asking? We're asking people to reduce the area in lawn. Lawn doesn't accomplish any of the ecological goals that all properties need to accomplish. And we want to replace that lawn with the native plants that do accomplish those goals. We want to remove the invasive species that are on our properties. Most people have invasive plants on their property and they don't even know it. If you're protecting any natural areas, as all land conservancies are doing, we certainly want to keep doing that. There are real ecological products associated with homegrown national park. Significant increase in biodiversity. I'll give you some examples of, of how well this works in a few minutes. Measurable reduction in invasive species. You know, if the country is 78% privately owned and everybody got rid of the invasives on their private property, we'd be 78% done. Um, that's encouraging. Significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. When you replace lawn with a planting like this or just about anything else, you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and tying it up uh, in spaces where it wasn't. Uh, sequestered before. So that's going to help climate change. You're also creating viable habitat outside of a park or a preserve. And every bit of conservation we do outside of parks is going to help conservation inside of parks. But there are real sociological products uh, as well. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We're trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional. It's essential for everybody because, and because everybody needs it, everybody shares the responsibility of sustaining it. We wanna convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we wanna record, we wanna merge all of the national conservation efforts that exist, Audubon and National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, again, all the land conservancies. We wanna get the good conservation they're doing on private property uh, registered on the map so we can see how well we are doing uh, in terms of, of overall conservation. You know, we got this 30 by 30 initiative. We're going to save 30% of the country by 2030. That will never happen unless we record conservation that's happening on private property. And there's urgency to enacting the homegrown national park solution. Remember that 135 million acres of residential landscapes? That's a big job. Uh, and and it's a big job, but if we di divide it up into uh, what do we have, 320 million people in this country, then it's not such a such a big job. In order to succeed, though, uh, there's a few things that we all need to to uh, learn and to agree upon. And we'll just talk about the four goals, the ecological goals that every property has. Every property is responsible for supporting a food web. In other words, choosing plants is going to capture energy from the sun and then pass it on so that you have animals in your, your local food web. Because if you don't, you don't have a, a functional ecosystem. Every landscape has to sequester carbon. Every landscape has to manage the watershed in which it lies. And every landscape has to support pollinators. Again, lawn accomplishes none of those goals, which is why we're targeting in that first off. Plant choice. We really have to focus on plant choice uh, because it's so important. This, of course, is burning bush, you know, a feature of, of the understory of, of most of New England. Um, there are three kinds of plants out there. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively remove energy from local food webs. <clears throat> the very best contributor in 84% of the counties in which they occur naturally is one of the oaks. Genus Quercus, we got 91 species of oaks in this country, and they're contributing more energy to local food webs than any other type of plant by far. A good example of a non-contributor would be something like a, a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's a nice ornamental plant, has, has a good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to the local food web. Uh, and a good example of a detractor would be any of those invasive uh, ornamentals. Most of them in the Northeast are from Asia that contribute very little energy to, to uh, food webs, uh, yet they uh, invade those food webs and push out the contributors that do con contribute the energy. We also have to understand how important caterpillars are to local food webs. They are the bread and butter of terrestrial food webs. They're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't support a lot of caterpillars, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And that is why keystone plants 
are so essential in our, our landscapes because they're the plants that support most of the caterpillars. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the, the Roman arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants away from uh, the local food web, the food web will collapse because they are making most of that caterpillar food. Just 14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the caterpillar species that drive our food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that support that house. They are, they are uh, essential to holding your house up. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. How do you know what the best keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, uh, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important woody and herbaceous plant genera for your county will pop up. So the old uh, uh, excuse of I don't know what to plant, that's just an excuse now. Now you do know what to plant. We also have to, to you know, revisit all those wonderful things that E.O. Wilson told us. Uh, and perhaps the most wonderful thing was insects are the little things that run the world. May not be a message that people want to hear, but uh, it is it is a fact. And most of those insects that are eating plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants, plants for which they have the evolutionary adaptations to get around the defenses of those particular plants. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. We all know the monarch and we all know that it is a host plant specialist on milkweeds, meaning that's the only thing it's going to develop on. We also know that milkweeds are toxic plants. They're loaded with cardiac glycosides, um, and sticky latex sap. So when you break open a vein, the, this white goo comes out. And when it's exposed to air, it gels. It turns into a chewing gum-like substance. Uh, and if a caterpillar gets that on its mouth parts, it glues its mouth shut. Uh, so how do, how do monarchs eat milkweed? Well, they have the adaptations to get around those defenses. They've got the, the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. They've got the behavioral adaptations that block the flow of sticky latex sap uh, and minimize their exposure to these nasty compounds. Uh, and those adaptations allow this, this beautiful caterpillar to eat a plant that most other insects can't eat. The point I want to hammer home here is that uh, milk, monarchs are not exceptions. 90% of the insects that eat plants have specialized relationships with particular plants, just like the monarch. So if we take those plants away and replace them with plants from someplace else, we lose those insects. Uh, and and we've, we've measured this uh, in my lab a number of times. What happens when we allow non-native plants to replace the native plants that those caterpillars need? Um, I'll just share one quick experiment with you. Went into uh, hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware with an undergraduate a few summers ago. And we measured caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were invaded. So here's autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and on and on and on. And compared the caterpillar populations in hedgerows that were not invaded. And we found when they're invaded, there's a 68% reduction in uh, the percentage of the amount of species that are in those hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of caterpillars in those hedgerows, and a 96% reduction in the biomass of those, those caterpillars, the actual energy that's in those, those uh, hedgerows. So if you think of caterpillars as bird food, we've reduced bird food by 96% when we allow these non-native plants to invade our habitats. We also have to understand how important pollinators are. Now we're, we're pretty good at this. Uh, pollinators have gotten a lot of press in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, but it's been misdirected. It's always focused on the pollinators required for agriculture. You hear the pollinators are, are required because they're pollinating a third of our, our agriculture. It's actually about a 12th of our agriculture. We do need pollinators, but we need them everywhere, not just in agriculture, because they are pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of, of the uh, plants on the planet, and that is certainly not an option. We also have to understand how important leaves are, fallen leaves. Right now, all those leaves are on the ground. What are we doing? We're raking them up, we're burning them, we're putting them out as if they're trash. Um, they have two critically important roles. Um, they are 
covering the ground, creating a blanket that maintains the moisture that our soil communities need. There are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. And those species are um, consuming these leaves, turning, returning the nutrients those leaves used, or the plant, the trees that drop these leaves, um, all the nutrients that tree used this past year are tied up in these leaves. If that doesn't get returned to the soil, uh, then the, when you know the tree grows in future years, it's not going to have enough nutrients. If we remove our, our leaves every single year, we're essentially starving our, our plants. So we need a closed nutrient cycle here where the, the leaves fall, they cover the ground, the detritivores uh, eat them and return those nutrients to the soil. The mycorrhizae allow the plants to take them up. Plus they are important sources of resources, uh, source of resources for an awful lot of insects that again are driving those, those food webs. People worry, well, I can't keep the leaves uh, on my property. I can't keep them on my lawn and I put them in my flower bed and they keep our plants from coming up. Um, they don't. You know, if they really did, we wouldn't. there wouldn't have been any plants uh, in North America when the Europeans got here because nobody was raking the leaves. Plants are very good at getting through a normal layer of, of uh, fallen leaves. Um, so don't worry about that. Let the leaves uh, fall in your in your flower beds. They will, your, your attractive plants will go right through them, no problem at all. And all ground covers, by the way, are not not short. Um, this is uh, white snake root at my house. Uh, the leaves are down there, you can't even see them. I didn't plant any of these, but uh, it's an attractive ground cover, uh, particularly because I leave those leaves there. We also have to understand how destructive light pollution is. It's one of the major causes of insect declines uh, around the world. This is good news though, because we have a very easy solution to our light pollution problems. Take out the white bulb and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are not attractive to nocturnal insects, particularly the moths that are running the food web by creating those, those caterpillars. If we were to switch out our, our white bulbs for yellow bulbs, Overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we used yellow LEDs, we would save millions of dollars as well. We got to talk about mosquito fogging. It is a booming business around the country uh, and it's terribly destructive. Uh, but the foggers say it's okay because what they're fogging is uh, a natural product. And it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids, it comes from uh, chrysanthemums, um, was evolved to kill insects in chrysanthemums. Uh, this is industrial strength pyrethroids, but it is a natural product. Uh, but, you know, that argument doesn't make any sense to me because cyanide is a natural product. Ricin is a natural product. Uh, nicotine is a natural product. There's a lot of natural products out there that are not very healthy. They also, excuse me, they also say that uh, this fogging only kills mosquitoes. Um, that's blatantly false. It kills all of the insects it comes in contact with, including the monarch, which is now red listed. This is just a handful of thousands of monarchs that were killed on Kent Island uh, in, in uh, the Chesapeake Bay a few years ago by a fogging event. And we're doing this all over the country. Um, what's interesting is it does not control mosquitoes. So we're doing this for nothing. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. And this, of course, is targeting uh, adults. You've got to kill 90% of the adults uh, to get good control, and mosquito foggers kill between 10 and 50%. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. And, and something a homeowner can do very easily is uh, use mosquito dunks, biological control. You get a bucket and you fill it full of water and you put in a handful of straw or hay or maybe some dead leaves, put it out in the sun for a few days to build up a population of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to ovipositing mosquitoes. The females that want to lay their eggs will preferentially lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12. This is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera, and the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's targeted, it's cheap, and if everybody did it, it would work. We have to. We don't want to undervalue our small properties. A lot of people say, well, my property is too small to do any effective conservation. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Even the smallest properties can, can be effective in conservation. This is Pam Carlson's house in, in uh, Chicago. It's one-tenth of an acre. Um, it's not 
connected to any natural area at all. Uh, she's recorded 125 species of birds uh, that uh, have used her property. And of course, it's very beautifully landscaped entirely with native plants. And if you have no property at all, container gardening works really well. Um, you put in plants that the local uh, bees and, and migrating monarchs will, will use. Remember, they're very mobile insects and they will find them even if you're on the fifth floor of your apartment complex. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and the biodiversity crisis. We can address both of these at the same time, and that is that conservation works. And it works so much better than people realize. This is the Natchusa grasslands in Illinois. It's 3,800 acres. There are more than 730 native plant species there now. 180 species of birds have been recorded there. It used to be a cornfield. So, and, and it wasn't that long ago. So conservation does work. <clears throat> this is what's happening at, at uh, our, our property where my wife, Cindy and I live in, in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. We moved into uh, a 10 acre lot. It was a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots in the year 2000. It had been mowed for hay before we moved in. So very, very few plants there at all. And of course, when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive species that are out there. Autumn olive and multiflora rose and bush honeysuckle and ornamental bittersweet and on and on and on. So when you stop mowing, that's what comes back. And that's what the entire 10 acres look like. Uh, it's a daunting task and a lot of people feel like giving up. But I can tell you, it is easier to get rid of this stuff than you think. You just get your wife to do it. That works. And when she's finished, you can put the plants back, uh, which is what we've we've done. Um, now we're still working on. It. I mean, there's there's you know there's a lot of plants that could go in there, but uh, the the ten acres is pretty well uh, vegetated now. <clears throat> Now, my research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths in your local food web, they're creating those caterpillars that are driving that food web. You have a very good index of how productive that food web is. In other words, how many species it's supporting and uh, how stable it is. So six years ago, I, I took it upon myself to take a picture of every species of moth that I found on our, our property. Uh, and I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,258 species of moths so far uh, because we put the plants back. That's a lot of species that are supporting a lot of other species. And many of them are, are pretty cool, like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil, the horrid zally, the forgotten frigid owlet. I always feel sorry for the forgotten frigid owlet. The visitation moth, I was visited by the visitation moth this summer. The obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there is an implicit arches. The snowy-shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the morbid owlet, the pink-shaded fern moth, the feeble grand moth, the feeble grass moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotus, the cynical quaker, the showy emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three-spot, the old wife underwing, the eyed pectes, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth on their property? The hog sphinx. This is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. Uh, and hundreds more uh, are now making a living in our house because we put the plants back. And people say, well, they're going to eat all your plants. Um, well, maybe, but remember all the things that are eating those caterpillars. They remember. They are the bread and butter of the food web. So many things depend on, on caterpillars, like birds. They are a, an individual bird, particularly when it's rearing your, its young, will eat hundreds of caterpillars every single day. And we've got 62 species of birds that have bred on our property because we've got the caterpillars that support that, that breeding. So I, I often wonder why I find any caterpillars at all, because the birds are eating them so, so often and so many of them. We also have a lot of insects that that uh, eat caterpillars, like ambush bugs, like assassin bugs, like predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of milkweed tussock moth and ate one caterpillar a, a day. Uh, there were fewer at the end. Parasitoids, a lot of hymenopteran parasitoids that lay their eggs in caterpillars and, and uh, develop within them. 
uh, and wasps that uh, sting the caterpillars, paralyze them, then carry the caterpillar off to their nest and lay an egg on it. This is nature's form of refrigeration. If they actually killed the caterpillar, it would rot before the egg even, even hatched. But when they paralyze it, it doesn't rot and the larva of the wasp can essentially eat it alive. And we got those vertebrates that are depending on our insects, like skunks, like possums, like raccoons, like foxes. 25% of a fox's diet is, is insects. And we've got frogs like spring peepers and toads and salamanders. We've got ringneck snakes. These guys all eat insects. And the cutest little gray tree frogs that are actually green when they're, when they're tiny. Um, so many things on our property that are keeping those insects under control. So no, they're not eating all of our plants. All right, um, we've come to realize that our lawn goals are too modest. Cutting the lawn in half is a great idea, but we've got to go beyond that. And that is because most of the property uh, is not in lawn. It is in small woodlots. It is in cropland or rangeland, even though it's privately owned. 406 million acres of woodlots that are managed by private citizens, not logging companies in the US. And when I say managed, they are managed for wood. They're, they're being logged, but there are ways to do that sustainably and how uh, those, those woodlots are managed and the invasive species load that they contain will determine their biodiversity value. Now, fortunately, we have organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests that tell us how you can manage your woodlot forever that does not involve clear cutting. There are two ways to do it. You can, there's, there's high grade harvesting where you take the best trees once and leave the junk. Uh, and you can do that once every 80 years. That's essentially a clear cut. It destroys the forest. Or you can take the worst first. You take everything but the, the, the best trees uh, and, and um, you do it more frequently. So you're not pounding that, that forest at any one time. And you can do that for uh, essentially forever. Um, so that's what I just said. But we have to manage the uh, invasive species that are in these woodlots. Uh, just about every every woodlot across the country has invasive species in it. Uh, and where I live, it's about 30% of the vegetation. This is a, a uh, preserved White Clay Creek uh, State Park near my house, uh, and it is loaded. I took this picture in March when all of the uh, species from Asia leaf out before species from North America. So every bit of green you see here is uh, an invasive species from, from Asia, um, which means we have degraded the, the value of these properties. Uh, well, uh, it turns out that the invasive species problem uh, is a function of us uh, releasing plants from, from other continents, but it's in combination with an overabundance of deer because the deer eat the natives, but they don't eat these invasives. And that tips the competitive balance against our natives. When every little oak that pops up gets nailed by a deer right away, but they won't touch the autumn olive or the barberry or the burning bush or the porcelain berry or all those other things. So of course, the only thing you have left are these invasive species. This is what a normal uh, woodlot uh, understory looks like. I took this picture in the Smoky, Smokies, the Great Smoky Mountains, where they don't have too many deer because they've got the predators that control them. Um, but this is what a typical understory looks like uh, in the Northeast where the deer are eating everything that comes up unless you, you cage them out. Uh, this exacerbates the problem with invasives, including stilt grass, including Asian jumping worms. Um, so good reasons to control our deer. Other good reasons, of course, would include Lyme disease. You folks in North and uh, the, Northeast understand this. I've had Lyme disease five times, so I, I get it. How do we control deer? We don't have time to spend uh, on this, but we can put the predators back. We can hire sharpshooters, which works temporarily and they're very expensive. Vern Blossie at Cornell suggests we consider market hunting again. It's very good at controlling um, animals, but we need to change some rules to do that. What do we do in the meantime? Uh, well, in my house, I've got a cage, uh, any plant that I, I want, uh, and that's that's what I've done. It works, uh, but of course, it's a pain in the neck. Okay, cropland. Got a lot of cropland out there too. 410 million acres of cropland. That's the light green area uh, in the U.S. Um, and you might think, well, there's nothing we can do to our cropland to improve biodiversity value, but that is not true. There are four things we can do. We can manage the roadsides. We can put hedgerows back in, in all, as many places as we can. We can include prairie strips. 
and we can minimize the use of neonicotinoid insecticides. The monarch has disappeared from so many places in North America, only about 3.6% left now, because we have turned roadsides in our agricultural areas into lawn. This is where uh, the milkweeds used to grow, the asters, the goldenrod, all the things that the monarchs and our native bees depended on. Um, with Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, we spray right up to the road, plant grass seed, then we have to mow it. So we're putting carbon back into the atmosphere and you've got rid of a tremendous amount of biodiversity. But you can put it back and people are doing that. They're doing a good job in Iowa and many other places. So if you own uh, some agriculture areas that is, is bordered by grass, considered revegetating it with appropriate meadow plants. Put the hedgerows back. Uh, and they've got to be hedgerows based on, on native plants, not, not autumn olive and those invasives. Um, and prairie strips, wonderful idea. You put prairie strips right through the corn and the soybeans, perpendicular to the flow of water off the landscape. And not only do they support pollinators, but they reduce topsoil loss by 95%. They reduce water pollution by 90%. Um, and they're supported by USDA CRP programs. So it's a win-win for everybody. It ought to be happening in every single piece of agriculture. Finally, neonicotinoid seed coatings. Neonics, they're 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. They're used preventively. In other words, whether or not you have an insect problem, you get a seed coating uh, on your corn or your soybeans or your wheat um, that is neonicotinoids. Uh, and if you compare um, the productivity, the, the yield of a plot with uh, that used neonics as seed coatings with a plot that did not use neonics with seed coatings, there is no boost in yield. Uh, so we're doing this for nothing. Only 5% of the product is taken up by the plants. 95% washes off into the watershed or blows away on dust where we have no idea what, what, uh, is, is, uh, what it's doing. Um, so again, uh, you know, this is unnecessary. It's, it's, it's kind of like a scam by the, the uh, seed companies and we should avoid it whenever possible. Okay, that brings us down to rangeland, the largest part of, of uh, the country, 770 million acres of rangeland out there, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle, but it does not have to be an ecological disaster. This is an experimental range in Nebraska that Cindy and I visited. These yellow things are, are sunflowers. All of the prairie birds were there. These are cows, they're not, they're not bison. But you can, you know, all grasslands evolved, co-evolved with, with grazers. It's a necessary part of the diversity of a grassland. So the cows or the bison or some grazer is necessary out there. The trick is to not overgraze. And believe it or not, beavers become a really important part of, of uh, the successful conservation of our grasslands, particularly in the Southwest. You know, we killed all the beavers. And what that did was allow uh, our streams to become incised. The beaver dams were gone. You got a rush of water down. It, it incut the, the streams. It lowered the water table, which dried out all the land around and, and removed many of our wetlands of the Southwest. And it was extremely easy to overgraze them. Uh, so if you put the beavers back or beaver analog dams, people are building the dams themselves. We can raise the water table again and create healthy uh, uh, watersheds, even in our grazed grasslands. But we've got to keep the cows out of those, those watersheds uh, because the cows will eat the willows and they'll eat the cottonwoods. And those are keystone plants in our grazing systems. Okay, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. Uh, and that is that whether or not they succeed depends on the decisions that you and I make. They're sociological issues, not scientific issues. I had a student uh, take a, a final two years ago, Amanda Crandall, and part of her answer was this. While conservation is claimed to be managing species and habitats, what we're actually managing is people. And that is so true. We're really talking about changing uh, our culture from an adversarial approach to nature to a collaborative one. Um, it's something we must do. And people wonder, can we actually do this? I think we can. It doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, a lot of people recognize that the planet has some serious environmental issues these days, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? 
Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can modify your lights. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can remove invasive plants from their property. One person can plant keystone plants. One person can fire a mosquito fogger. If you own grazed land, you can keep the cows out of the water and put the beavers back. If you own cropland, you can put the hedgerows back. You can, you can revegetate your roadsides. There's a lot that one person can do. And join Homegrown National Park and totally revitalize the ecosystem where you live uh, and contribute to the local ecosystem where you are rather than continuing to degrade it. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think uh, about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the earth that you can, you can manage. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So we hope that Homegrown National Park will provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people. That's quite an army out there, millions of people to tackle these conservation issues. And whether or not we do so today is going to determine nature's fate tomorrow and then ultimately our own. So please get on the map. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, that was uh, very informative and spot on in terms of what we were hoping for. Um, we have some time for questions. Uh, one question that's been posted on the chat is in removing invasives. Uh, there are so many different uh, invasives, obviously, but what can you talk about some of your favorite techniques for s some of your most hated invasives? <laughs> My most hated invasive on my property now is Japanese stilt grass, which is a, uh, it's an annual. Uh, I do not have a good solution for that one. So let's talk about the woody plants, which are easier to get rid of. Um, you know, there's, there's always the decision, do I use an herbicide or not? A mattock, you know what a mattock is? It looks like a pickaxe, but it's got one broad uh, end, um, is a wonderful tool for whacking out things like, like buckthorn, things like autumn olive, things like barberry, uh, multiflora rose, whack, 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 and out it comes. Uh, and you've got the roots uh, too. So you can do an awful lot with a mattock. If you've got some really big uh, plants, you have to kill the root systems or they just keep coming back and back and back. I mean, you can cut them over and over and over again, but long ago I decided I'm not gonna live long enough to, to win that war. So I do uh, use uh, a little bit of herbicide, uh, I paint the stumps. I, I saw them off at the base and then uh, paint an herbicide solution onto the trunk. I don't use Roundup. That's designed for a foliar spray. It's not designed as a stump spray. So you want to get something that's oil-based and will penetrate those roots. You're using very little material and you kill it and you only have to do it once. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, you know, I, I understand uh, the desire to not use any herbicide at all. But I think of it as, as chemotherapy. We do have ecological tumors out there. And you know, just like a tumor in your body, if you don't kill it, there are consequences. And doing nothing to avoid the use of herbicide, uh, but letting those guys run, run wild, I think uh, you know, the consequences are, are, are worse if you don't control them. So that's my personal decision. You can make your own. But a lot of these things are, are ultimately controllable it's all a lot of work. You know, I don't want to minimize that. Burning bush, I see. What about burning bush? Yeah, whack, 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 out it goes <laughs> with that with that mattock. Or cut it up at the base and paint it. Another question for you, Doug. We have a, a number of fields in Cornwall. And um, you know that if you leave fields uncut forever, they eventually get overgrown. And so uh, what's your recommendation uh, to keep a a field sufficiently wild, but not uh, being turned back into forest. Right. We live in an area of the country that wants to be forest. And it, it used to be kept open by large grazers. I mean, bison went all the way to the Atlantic and there were big herds of them. Uh, and they help keep things open. Uh, the Native Americans managed uh, open areas with fire. 
so we've gotten rid of the bison. We've gotten rid of the large place to see mammals. We've gotten rid of the Native Americans managing with fire. Uh, so what's going to keep our meadows meadows? Um, it, you know, you, fire is a wonderful thing. You have to be trained in, 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 and the Midwest folks wonder why we don't burn in the East the way they do. But if you don't want to do that, mowing is the option. Uh, but but you have to, people say, how can I mow without killing everything? You, you can't. So what you do is you mow one third of your, your meadow each year. So a third, a third, a third, which means any one part of your, your meadow is going to be mowed once every three years. So two thirds will not be mowed in any given year. And that will provide the animals that can recolonize the area you did mow. Now, a lot of people use mowing to control woody plants. It doesn't work because it doesn't kill the rootstock. And every year they, there's a few more of them and they come back more and more and more. If you mow frequently enough to control the woodies, you, you don't have a meadow anymore because that's that's like every three weeks or something. So spot uh, controlling of woodies as they come in uh, is what I recommend. Um, you know, it, it can seem like a big job because it is a big job, but, but one thing I'd love for people to try is hire a, a college student. Say, I'm gonna give you $4,000 this summer and you're gonna control Woody's in my meadow all summer long. That's all you're gonna do. You'd be amazed at how much they they get done and it wouldn't cost that that much. Well, those are good suggestions. What's your opinion about bug zappers? <laughs> yes, they're still being sold. We did a study way back in 1996 um, looking at what percentage of the kill is actually biting flies. Of course, people are putting them out there mostly for mosquitoes, uh, but you know we do have a few other species of biting flies. And the answer was 0.01%. So 99.9% .9 of the insects killed in a bug zapper are non-targets. They are not biting flies. Uh, and a lot of people say, that's that's crazy. I had a woman bring a bag of, of all the insects her bug zapper killed this past summer. She brought it to me. She said, look at all those mosquitoes. They're not mosquitoes. They're midges. Midges don't even have mouth parts. It's in the family Chironomidae. So yeah, there's a lot of them, but they're not mosquitoes. They're not biting you. And you might feel like you're doing a good job, but you're really, you're, it, it's, you know, it's devastating the local food web when you're killing all these things for nothing. It just makes you feel good. Don't buy yeah. a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that's uh, a big issue in the Northeast here are ticks. Yeah. And frequently I hear uh, people saying, uh, well, we have to mow our lawn and we apply the the stuff you were talking about to, to get rid of ticks because ticks carry disease. What What's your... What's your thinking there as to how we can uh, get people to do things that uh, maybe control ticks, but not kill everything else? Ticks are a big issue. Um, uh, they do carry disease. They, but the one we have to worry about here is Lyme disease, the black-legged tick, the deer tick. We have too many ticks because we've got too many deer. So the ultimate solution is to control the deer, get them back below the carrying capacity. You know, where I live, we've got 14 times more deer than the land can support. And no wonder you've got an explosion of Lyme disease and, and ticks. Um, so that's difficult for one person to do. It's another good reason to consider fire because fire is a great way to control the, your local ticks if you if you burn your, your meadow. Uh, but you're right, a mowed area uh, is not where the ticks wanna be. So it's a great reason to have paths of, of uh, turf grass through your property so that you can walk on those and not have to, you can go out and enjoy your property without having to, to walk into the, you know, the tall stuff, particularly in May and June, that's the area, the time when infectivity is the highest. Um, and, and you can, you can avoid it that way. There's a product called Daminex, which uh, it's essentially cotton soaked in um, pyrethroids. And the other, the third part of the, the Lyme disease cycle is it's chicks, deer, and white-footed mice. But the mice will take these cotton products back to their nest, build a nest out of it, uh, and it kills the ticks on the mouse. Um, and, and that's, it's not, you know, there's some evidence that it works, works pretty good, pretty well without killing everything else. Um, 
these are all stopgap measures. We're going to have ticks and Lyme disease until we control our deer. So that's the ultimate solution. Well, that, those are, are good suggestions. Um, are there other questions for Doug uh, to uh, talk about? What in, in terms of getting people to reduce their lawn size, how do you create a culture of uh, let, let the grass grow, uh, don't mow at all? Um, remember, I say reduce the area of lawn, not get rid of your lawn. So lawn is a cue for care. It's a, it's a signal that you get what the culture is and you're not, you're not bucking the neighborhood and you're not going to reduce property values. You're just going to have less of it. But the lawn you keep should be manicured. You continue to mow it. That's where those paths are. Mow, lawn should be, uh, Thomas Rayner said, it should be area rugs, not wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, so, so we're not talking about just letting your, your, your lawn grow. We're talking about having actual plantings, re re remove the lawn and put other things there. And then the lawn you keep will be a cue for care along the driveway, along the sidewalk, uh, lining the new new uh, flower beds or beds that you put in your your property. They should all be lined with with uh, turf grass. And then you know what? Your neighborhood doesn't even know that you, they don't recognize that you did that. You just have more trees. You've got more things living there. But you're still a good citizen because you're mowing your lawn. That's all they care about. Well, that's interesting. It also reminds me that some of our town properties are lawn. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We have uh, a, in the center of Cornwall, a, a wonderful sort of town park, and it's 100% lawn. Uh, that's an interesting... So there are places where lawn's appropriate. And if it's in a gathering, in a place where people gather, even if it's only three or four times a year, um, lawn's a perfect plant to walk on without killing it. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying we can't have parks and things. Another good way to reduce the lawn is to put a bed under all of your trees. And if you make that bed out to the drip line, you've reduced a lot of lawn. And you can you can put in ground covers there uh, so that it's it's less maintenance, less mowing. It also is it, your tree loves that it absorbs more. That's one of the ways you can keep water on your property instead of having it run off. And it also provides a great place for the caterpillars that develop in that tree to to pupate. They drop from the tree, and they either spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree, or they they tunnel underground. So even in a public park, you can have beds under the trees and and uh, make it a much more ecologically sound place. Now that's good. Okay. And we have one last question. It goes back to the deer uh, issue. Uh, we do allow the conservation trust does allow legacy hunting on its properties for deer, but uh, you talked about reintroducing predators. Um, I know the black bear up here uh, is a predator of fawns, but uh, what other predators might be reasonably introduced that according to the well, chat you know, when I went to the, the Smokies and I saw this wonderful understory, the first thing I asked them is, how are you controlling your deer? And they said, we don't control the deer. And I said, well, <laughs> why don't you have too many deer? And he said, we've got black bear, we've got coyotes, and we've got bobcats. And all of them take uh, deer at, at different stages. Um, they don't have wolves which is the major predator of, of deer, and they don't have cougars. Uh, but those three are controlling the deer in the Great Smoky Mountains. So um, I was surprised to see it, but I did see it. Um, so you've got black bear, it's a good start. Uh, I bet you have open season on coyotes, shoot them anytime you see them. Uh, that's a bad idea. It's it's a, you know, it's a predator that that is helping out. Um, bobcats, the population is never big enough, but make sure you do everything you can to encourage them, uh, because they'll, they'll take fawns as well. Well, that's all very good. And I, I, I do appreciate we've, we've run out of time at this point, but Doug, you've given us lots of thought and, uh, good ideas for acting locally while we think globally and thank you and thank everyone for coming. And, uh, this will be recorded. You can send it to your friends. It's something to talk about over Thanksgiving rather than politics or religion. 
<laughs> uh, so have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And thank you again for your support of Cornwall Conservation Trust. And Doug, I look forward to getting lawns cut back. <laughs> All right. well, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.